Hello and greetings from Los Angeles. My name is Susanne Gensicke. I'm the head of antiquities conservation at the J. Paul Getty Museum. We are located at the Getty Villa Museum, home of the Getty's collection of ancient Greek, Roman and Etruscan art. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's art break, which I will conduct jointly with Denise Doxy um, under the title, The Golden Cylinders of Ancient Nubia, What Were They? We take inspiration from objects in the Getty special exhibition, Nubia, Jewels of Ancient Sudan, from the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, on view here at the Getty Villa until April 3rd. Before joining the Getty, I had the pleasure of working at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, in particular on the collection from Nubia and these cylinders, and often with my colleague, Denise Doxy. And I'm pleased to welcome you, Denise, um, on the other side of the country. Over to you. Thank you, Suzanne. And thank everyone for spending part of their afternoon with us. Uh, my name is Denise Doxy, and I'm the curator for Ancient Egyptian, Nubian, and Near Eastern Art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And as Suzanne said, I had the pleasure of working with her in Boston and also on this uh, exhibition, which we are delighted to have at the Getty Villa. But we, we are going to talk about these enigmatic gold and gilded silver cylinders and try to explore what they might have been. But before we do that, I would like to give you just a little bit of background on where they were found and under what circumstances. This is the pyramid of the pyramid field of Nuri in northern part of Sudan. And this uh, cemetery served as the royal burial ground for Nubia's leaders from the very beginning of the 7th century BC up until about the 3rd century BC. So there are over 70 pyramids here. It was founded by uh, King Taharqa, who was the most powerful uh, king in the history of ancient Nubia. Uh, and under him and his immediate ancestors, uh, Nubia had not only uh, taken over Egypt, but had an extensive empire um, throughout northeastern Africa and right up into the Near East. It's a very breathtaking place right now, but it also uh, looks very deserted, which uh, was not the fact in antiquity at all. So to put it on the map for you quite literally, I will um, go to the next slide and uh, you can see where that yellow arrow is pointing is the location of Nuri. It is, as you can see in Northern Sudan, on the, the right bank of the Nile, opposite the site of Jebel Barkal. And Jebel Barkal in antiquity was known as Napata. And it was served as the capital city of the Kushite empire. And in fact, gave its name to this dynasty of kings that ruled from here, which we call the Napatan period. And now Jebel Barkal in its day was really not at all remote, it was a a major commercial hub, trading center, and a religious sanctuary as well. And Suzanne has actually spent quite a lot of time in Nuri and Devil Barkal in the past, and um, she might be able to give you a better sense of the, the landscape. Yes, it's a beautiful area. You can see how the Nile is um, <clears throat> forming a huge S curve in the northern Sudan. It is the river is very wide there, with with lush gardens on both sides, cutting through the desert. And then there's Jebel Barkal, this huge butte mountain visible from a long distance. And it was actually visible from the necropolis at Nuri. So uh, how did these objects come to end up in Boston? And the reason for that is that the Museum of Fine Arts in conjunction with Harvard University excavated the cemetery at Nuri between 1916 and 1918. And here you can see they're working on the site. Um, the pyramid field is in the background and part of their laboratories are in these tents. And these two excavators in the foreground are attempting to put in order the more than 1,000 stone funerary figurines known as Schwabtis that came from the big pyramid of Taharqa, the largest at the site. If we fast forward another 100 years, we come to the reign of another king named Espelta. And Espelta was um, not as powerful as Taharqa was, but it's, his tomb actually preserved some of the finest and most important objects that were discovered at Nuri. And if you see in the slide here, this is his burial chamber and well, one or two burial chambers. And a piece of the ceiling had collapsed in antiquity. 
And the only reason this material survived is because when grave robbers ultimately came to loot the tomb, they didn't find it because it was hidden under the fallen ceiling. So here's Del Stunham uh, in the center. This is back to us. He was in charge of our excavations. And uh, along with Del Stunham in the necktie and Ty Mohammed in the turban, he is painstakingly attempting to extricate what you can just make out inside that circle as little cylindrical objects from the dirt at the bottom of the tomb. So we can see what some of this treasure looked like um, after it came to Boston. Uh, this uh, group of objects consisted of a large number of alabaster vessels. Uh, we have uh, gold vessels, silver vessels, eight pairs of these giant oversized tweezers in both gold and silver, and 15 of these silver and gilded silver and gold cylinders. On the left side, in the black and white photograph, the objects were quite crushed and disfigured and not easily recognizable after excavation. As Denise said, the ceiling had collapsed and also these very fragile precious metal cylinders were deeply impacted in the soil. Um, we will talk more about the material from which they were made, but let me just say most of them were made from gilded silver and silver does corrode during burial. It forms thick corrosion layers, all of which is visible in the left slide. Once the material was shipped to Boston, William Young, the head of the research laboratory at the museum, used um, methods which at that point in time in the first half of the 20th century were state of the art. He used chemical methods and electrolytical, electro chemical methods to clean the corroded metal and on the right side are the cylinders the way they look now. They are again golden, shiny, but in the process also a lot of information was lost. Um, the interior of these cylinders may have held organic materials, traces, pseudomorphs that would inform us what they contained, but in the, you know, overly aggressive, as we say now, cleaning process, that information was lost. And you, I also should say that some of these fragile gilded surfaces were soldered with modern solder onto modern silver support. So the um, physical shape was retrieved, but there is a lot of modern material now um, in these cylinders. Um, the cylinders measure four and a half to five centimeters inches in height, and they're about an inch and a half in diameter. They perfectly fit in your hand. Fit perfectly <laughs> into your hand. And um, we will take you deeper into the nature of these mysterious items. So um, as Susanna and Tim in their research discovered, there are basically four types of decoration on these cylinders, or at least on those that are preserved. Um, they all have a taller bottom portion and then a separately made top portion that's a little bit shorter in scale. So some of these have registers of gods and goddesses standing one above the other. Some of them have winged goddesses uh, with their wings outspread, which go all the way around the cylinders. Some of them have a seated male god the God Hech, the God of Eternity, and some of them are just plain. And at the tops, the decoration generally consists of a rows of rearing cobras and floral motifs, sometimes ram's head representing the God Amun or other seated deities. And so here you see a chart which we devised when we studied these objects 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. And I also have to say there, um, some are still fragmentary kept in storage. So there may actually be more bits of cylinder sheets than we recognized, but we created this chart with the um, three main decoration motifs, the seated gods, the standing goddess, and the a double register of smaller standing gods. And um, King Asbelta's tomb contained the largest number, 15. We see 
hesitantly, maybe a suggestion of pairs. You see there are two of the seated Hesgod from Nuri's three of Senka Meniskin's tomb, um, two of the double register of tiny standing gods from Aspelta. There are about 24 cylinders, two are made from pure gold, four are in Khartoum in the Sudan, the remainder are in Boston. But we don't know how many more may have existed, how many more have been lost or robbed. Um, but it is, um, it is interesting to think about them as being made in pairs. I also want to point out to the time distribution. Um, most of them date to the sixth century BC, although there are some earlier and some later ones. And, and again, we don't know how widely they were distributed over the centuries. Denise. The primary uh, decorated motif on most of the uh, cylinders from the tomb of Aspelta features a standing goddess who, as you can see on this drawing by Suzanne Chapman, where it's been unrolled, so to speak, uh, a single goddess standing uh, with outspread wings and seated gods to either side. These goddesses um, are thoughtfully labeled in many cases. So in this case, we know we have Isis, the quintessential mother goddess, but we have other goddesses as well, including Hathor, who is a goddess of love and music and fertility. And we have Mut, who's the, the wife, the consort of Amun Ra, the supreme god. And winged goddesses play a very prominent role in Nubian art and, and Nubian jewelry as well, which anyone who's come to the show will see. So these are a very popular feature. They probably served as uh, both protectors of the king and or queen, as the case may be, and um, as a, a reassurance of rebirth in the afterlife. Let's look at one example here of a particularly opulent cylinder. Um, as Denise said, they were made in sections. In the center is a drawing that shows you a cross section of this cylinder. And you um, may be able to make out that the upper tube was upper section, the upper third was inserted to the lower part of the tube. They were soldered together in ancient times. All bases of these cylinders are firmly, permanently enclosed with an applied round disc decorated with a rosette here. Um, the underside of one of those cylinders showing a very plain rosette. Other rosettes um, show inlays or applied wire. Or, so we have a whole range of, of um, decoration and we'll go a little bit deeper. Um, look at the cylinder on the left. Um, it is made from gilded silver in many different elements. You see two horizontal kind of geometric bands at the base and near the bottom of the upper third. Those are metal cloisons. They're still filled with a colored paste and the uh, compartments would have originally held either cut glass or semi-precious stones. So this um, cylinder was bejeweled. Um, the top rim section was covered with a smooth gilded silver rim, um, a ring soldered on providing a, 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 a nice smooth um, rim. So there's no indication of a lid or any closure, which makes us be to believe that these cylinders were meant to be open and contain something. I um, also want to point out above the head of the standing goddess, you see a section of horizontal round wires. We call it sort of a rope section. Keep that in mind as we will speak about that further. In the next slide, I'll show you more details of decoration. On the left, you see the same cylinder we saw previously, but a little bit more close up. You see the empty cloisons. You see small ram heads surmounted by sun disks, rearing cobras. As I said, a lot of these cylinders were made from gilded silver. And in the center of this slide is a 
an image with which I can prove to you that it was gilded silver and what gilded silver looks like in a metallographic cross section. Um, we were able to take from small loose fragments, tiny metallographic samples, embed those into epoxy resin, polish them, and then examine these surfaces, their stratigraphy under, um, micro under a microscope. And in metallographic cross sections, you then can see the structure of the metal, the grain structure. What you see here looks like a landscape perhaps, is a large part of the image is gray and white. That is the silver, which in parts is very heavily corroded, mineralized and cracked. And then at the top, you have this vaguely, slightly yellow colored surface. And that actually is a gilding layer, which is still well preserved because gold does not corrode as readily as silver. In order to create a gilded silver surface, um, the craftsman would apply a thin sheet foil of gold to the silver, maybe burnish it on and heat it. And gold and silver are readily compatible metals and would form a metallic bond, which was, was only broken uh, by corrosion over a long period of time. It's tremendously labor intensive. And why were they making um, all of these small details out of gilded silver? Was it an attempt to save gold? That does not seem quite plausible. On the right, um, more beautiful tiny details you see in the upper image, small figures and tiny little rosettes, which were stamped separately and then soldered onto the cylinder. And at the bottom, you see an example of granulation and repoussé by which the metal was worked from front and back to create a raised relief. So who created these cylinders? Um, we, of course, don't know. We don't have any workshops excavated, but it could have been um, metal workers who also made royal jewelry. Um, where did they come from? Where did they get their inspiration from? Those are questions we cannot answer. But I want to show you another item in the next image, which also carries a bejeweled decoration. On the left, you see a light colored um, Egyptian alabaster vessel. It is called an alabastron, a bag shaped vessel. These types of vessels were widely used in the ancient world to contain unguents or perfume. This piece comes from the tomb of Espelta, again, the tomb that Denise talked about earlier. And it is the only alabastron in the world, as far as I know, whose rim was bejeweled, again, with cloisons which were inlaid. The wreck neck carries the same kind of strange rope structure that we see on the cylinders. And then it has a flaring rim and it carries semi-precious stones suspended by golden chains, almost like earrings. So it's a tremendously beautiful, complicated piece. And there is a relationship to the cylinders, I feel. Um, but we need to look at other parallels and we will next look at mirror handles. And I have to say, I agree with Susanna about the likelihood that these are all manufactured by the same people who manufacture jewelry because so many of the techniques, the repoussé, the granulation, the very, very fine wire work is also found exclusively, extensively in jewelry. Now, these two objects, which are actually nearly 100 years apart, but the one on the right comes from that uh, the same tomb as that very elaborate um, cylinder that we looked at in cross section earlier. And these are obviously mirrors. Um, and they, they do draw some interesting parallels to the iconography of the cylinders. Namely, they have standard gods and goddesses, um, standing gods and goddesses on them. That rope decoration above their heads, similar to what was above the heads of the goddesses on the, uh, the cylinders. They have plant motifs. Uh, actually, they're meant to be columns in the shape of plants. And on the one on the, on the left, you have the, uh, the line of cobras at the top. What you can't see in the slide is that they also have bottoms which are decorated with rosettes. So there's a lot of similarity in the decoration of these mirrors to the cylinders, but 
it is not likely that our handles could be handles of mirrors because they are way too lightweight. These mirrors are very heavy. And uh, so it just sort of, it's sort of taunting hint at what sorts of things these people were making in addition to jewelry. Yeah. The, ever since, sorry, go ahead, Suzanne. Yeah, the luxury goods from these tombs are really astounding. And um, I just want to point out, you know, Denise said these were mirrors. Of course, you can't really see today that these surfaces were once reflective. Um, the green colored, warty, crocodile skin like looking uh, surface yes. on the left um, is, is very heavy. It's, it was cast bronze, which once would have been shiny and reflective. Um, and the silver mirror on the right is now pitted also because it was heavily corroded and burial. Nonetheless, they're still absolutely precious and beautiful. Um, yes, Denise, you had other thoughts about their use. Yes, well, ever since these were discovered, people have been to making different suggestions about the use of the cylinders. Um, so if we go back to the, if we want to the next slide, we revisit our goddess. Um, I should say some of the, Theories included maybe they were used as uh, handles for rolled papyrus um, used in some sort of temple ritual, um, or that they were used for um, as cases for amulets or amuletic prayers. Uh, now, Tim Kendall, in his research, looked to the imagery on the cylinders themselves and noticed that these goddesses are almost all holding ostrich feathers in their hands. And ostrich feathers were associated with uh, kingship, but also with justice and the right world order. And we see people also in other contexts who are taking part in ceremonies who are carrying either ostrich feathers or uh, bouquets of palm fronds. And the way these are held in the hands really could suggest that they were used as a handle for something of this nature, which is more lightweight than a mirror, but um, also a part of the sacred ritual. Now, more recently, following up on that, um, a scholar by the name of Amaryllis Pompey, who specializes in um, the royal regalia of the ancient Nubians, um, postulated that they could be handles for a type of musical instrument called a sistrum in the singular, or sistra in the plural. Uh, this is an example from Egypt, but roughly contemporary with the the examples um, from that we were looking at from Nubia. Um, and Sistra were particularly associated with the goddess Hathor. Um, the, the jingling sound of these rattles as they were shaken, were it was believed to attract the attention of the gods and bring them into your presence. Um, now, what is a little peculiar in this theory is that the, and with the mirrors as well, is that in no case has there been any of the upper part of the system, the functional musical instrument part, the wires or the discs. Uh, and Marillus Pompey does um, offer an explanation for that, namely that the system itself might have been too valuable or too sacred uh, for to, to be buried so that the handles, which are personalized for the kings, could be removed and buried with the king and the system used by next generations. Um, so that's a compelling theory. Uh, it also uh, resonates with the idea that the royal women, especially the queen mother, were actually often shown in uh, ceremonies, particularly coronation ceremonies, uh, taking the place of Hathor and symbolically justifying the king's divine right to rule. So that's an interesting theory too. But having said that we were going to talk about what these things mean, I am now potentially going to disappoint everyone because I'm. while both of these theories are perfectly plausible, I'm still not 100% convinced that either one of them is correct because without that organic material that might have been in there before that cleaning, state of the art though it was, it's really just a guess at this point. So um, by all means, if you have any theories, do let us know. Yes, <clears throat> we look forward to your questions. Um... In the end, I think we're thrilled that we were able to present to you these beautiful and truly unique items, which are one of the many innovations of ancient Nubian culture. So we are now happy to take your questions and 
I shall open the Q&A um, to see um, what your thoughts and suggestions are. And I think, yes, so I will, I will go chronologically. Here's a question. Um, I will repeat it. Would you see this as an authentic Nubia or can they be found elsewhere? And I, I can answer that quickly and with confidence. To my knowledge, these items are only found in Nubia and only in a you know fairly narrow time period um, related to the Napatan kingdom. Denise? I don't, I don't think any, I mean, obviously it's an excellent of what survives tomb robbery and uh, belting down and so on, but I don't really think I know of any outside of Nuri itself, even elsewhere in Nubia. Right. Um, here is a question that probably is for you, Denise. Do the decorations on the cylinders try to convey a story? Were they made to commemorate an event? That's a great question. And because we, we don't actually know who made them or why, the, um, it's likely, I would say, that they, event, they commemorate a mythical event. Um, and there have been different suggestions about um, what mythical event that may be. Uh, Solange Ashby has done research about the, the role of Hathor um, escaping to Nubia and uh, threatening to destroy civilization and then ultimately being appeased. And some of these goddesses are goddesses that are, are, are clearly known to be Hathor. But others that have gods and goddesses mixed, um, it's tough to say with any certainty. Right. Um, here is a material question. The Sudan is not known for silver. Is it known? It is known for gold. True. Um, any idea where the silver may have come from? Um, you know, um, that's a very good question. Yes, um, there were plenty of gold mines and gold sources in the northern Sudan. Silver was widely used in the 8th, 7th, 6th century BC in the ancient world. Um, it would have been obtained by trade. It could have come through Egypt. I mean, Egypt doesn't have silver mines from, but from the Near East. So, um, and and we do have quite a bit of silver vessels, for example, in Espelta's tomb. Um, here's another technical question. You mentioned that some parts of the cylinders were soldered what soldering technique was used. Um, and that's from a fellow conservator, Terry Weiser. <laughs> Hi, Terry. Um, <laughs> very good question. Um, I I think there were um, um, alloys of, of silver and copper, but to be quite honest, um, it's a study that needs to be done. We really need to look at solder joints more carefully. Um, there may also be colloidal, colloidal sold, soldering, you know, on the on the gold. Let me see. Um, here's another technical question. Do you know how the decorative Egyptian blue pigment was secured to the metal substrate? I'm not sure if it had a binder, um, uh, it, it, or if it was mixed in with, you know, a calcium carbonate gesso material. We haven't done any binder analysis on that. We definitely have conservatives, conservators in the audience today. <laughs> Hello, um, Fabia. It is fascinating to see how much scholars are forced to theorize about these objects. Um, are there even more ideas about what the cylinders might be, even far-fetched ones? Denise, I'm sure you have other thoughts. Well, I mean, the, the fact that they're handles is definitely, I think, a likelihood. But they could also be, I'm thinking about the nature of the other objects that were found, at least in the group when it's built as tomb, we, where we've got uh, cosmetic vessels and tweezers and other cosmetic related objects. But I wonder if they might, they couldn't have been used for liquid because they have no time, it would just spill out. But could they have held something like a uh, scented wax that was used as incense in some part of a ceremony, but wouldn't necessarily have survived? Um, or um, can, being compared to these, because we do have these, these giant uh, sets of tweezers that 
could these be sort of an oversized cold jars for um, you know the cosmetic uh, eye paint, which is you know frequently kept in jars, it's a similarly shaped, but um, certainly whatever um, it was they were used for it was something that was at, was part of the funerary ritual. Um, but exactly, I and I don't, I don't know of any really crazy theories. I'm sure there were some out there, but. Um, here's a quick question that I can answer. Um, could they could they be handles that slide onto a pole of some sort? Um, well, the bottom is closed, so a pole could have slid into them. But that's um, an interesting an interesting question because we do have um, from the adjacent um, Royal Cemetery to Jebel Blakar, which is called El Kuru, that are copper. Um, and their poles, they're a lot longer than these, and they end with sort of hands, but they also have these um, inlaid, um, sometimes enameled surfaces, and you know, they uh, different applied decoration to them, and they're very beautiful. And the theory is that those actually were holders for poles that held canopies over oh. the heads, because you see the kings and queens standing under, you know, with servants holding up canopies over their heads to keep them out of the sun. Um, these would have to be something a lot lighter weight. Those are also big and heavy, but um, but a pole of some sort, um, some kind of a scepter, maybe. Scepter. And then the, um, I'm, I'm reminded this is a completely different time period and culture, but uh, there, there are these decorated um, handles from the tomb of Tutankhamun with granulation from the sticks and staves. And, and daggers so even. Um, here's a question for Denise. Aside from the Getty Villa, where can we find these objects? Are they touring? Yes, they are. Um, so you've got another uh, week, another not quite month to see them in Los Angeles. And then very shortly thereafter, they will be going to Atlanta to the High Museum. Uh, so anybody in the southeast will be able to see them there. And we are hoping for one additional venue, but we aren't 100% certain whether we will have one with our name. <clears throat> and then right. the long-term goal is to have our new Nubian gallery back in the MFA, but uh, fingers crossed that there's a lot of fundraising to do for that. That will be beautiful when it, when it happens. Um, an obvious question, <laughs> has there been any chemical analysis of the interior to identify residue of what might have been contained in the cylinders. Yes, um, you know, as I said, these pieces were highly mineralized and crushed and they were treated long time ago by a chemist um, who then, you know, as was common back then, didn't keep a lot of written or photographic records. So if there were organic remnants, those would have been lost in the treatment. I don't know actually if the cylinders in the Sudan in the uh, National Museum in Khartoum, if they were ever treated or if they still contain something. Um, so that might be worth a trip. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> um, next question, is it possible that perfume or cosmetics would be kept in these cylinders? I think you hinted to the possibility. Um, Denise, um, here's another question. Have these cylinders only be, been found in royal tombs or also among the elite? These have been, it's, I'm 99.9% .9 certain only in royal tombs. Um, not, they're both kings and queens, but I don't believe there's, and of course, in some cases, we don't have names preserved, so we can't be certain um, if there's not an inscription on something in the tomb. We don't necessarily know who was buried there, but um, I, I would say with quite certainty that they right. are only loyal. Right. Um, here's a question. The gilding on the cylinders is not mercury gilding, but it is a heating process, right? That comes from our dear colleague, Tom Chase. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Um, yes, it's a diffusion gilding. Um, here's a question for Denise, and that this is a fascinating one. Some statues of the kings show them holding some round cylindrical items. What are those? I think they're referring to the um, 
Yes, I Shout know. Out stick. They are actually the the Nubian examples are inspired by Egyptian examples, which are thousands of years older. They um, went back and explored um, and renovated temples in, in Egypt when they were in charge of Egypt. And they um, brought back this sort of ar archaizing Old Kingdom style. And these objects are held in almost the hands of almost every male statue from the Old Kingdom in Egypt, it's 40, 2400, 2500 BC. And nobody knows what they were. And I cannot give a gallery talk without someone asking, what are those things? And oh, people, they're as mysterious as the cylinders are. People have tried yes. um, to explain what they are. Um, I don't want to take up all of the question and answer time, but one theory is that they're handkerchiefs. Uh, another theory is that they're some kind of a container for uh, a scroll or something like that, or that they are just abbreviated versions of what would be a long stick, like a scepter. Because in wooden statues, kings often do have a scepter in their hand, but in a stone statue, it would just be too likely to break off and too cumbersome that they might just be a truncated version of that. So those are some of the more popular theories. But again, many trees have died over these uh, debates. Here is a um, an important, straightforward question: Which museum in Atlanta, and until when will they be displayed? It's the High Museum of Art. And I don't have the date at my fingertips. It opens in the summer and goes to the fall, I think. It's, 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 oh, it's starting in June, I'm told. Um, here, um, a technical question, since gold was more available and silver may have had to be traded, would the gilded silver be considered more valuable and special and also, since the silver and gold would have been ma malleable, can you assume that however they were used, they could not support a lot of weight? Um, so at that time in history, I think um, silver was less valuable in, than gold. Gilded silver was, you know, was also used in Egypt. In, just to go back in time during the Old Kingdom in Egypt, silver was more valuable than gold due to its scarcity. But I think at this point um, that the value um, between gold and silver was reversed. Oh God, now the question disappeared. Um, these, these are still quite thin. So that's why we think they would not have been able to support a lot of weight. Um, here is a fun question. Um, if you owned one of those, how would you use it? I would keep it someplace where the cat couldn't get to it. Um, <clears throat> you could keep cat treats in it. <laughs> to get that to I, I would put special cat treats in there. Um, you know, some people may put folding green in there. <laughs> Um, oh, we have a, a question about if they had been attached to something, um, would there be evidence of where or remnants of the adhesive? And I think the cleaning kind of eliminates the likelihood of having any remnants of an adhesive. But there was a catalog published by the British Museum some years ago in which uh, the author, and I don't remember who the author was of the essay, sorry, um, said that there were, and these might be the ones that are in cartoon, that they have um, grooves that isn't actually wood, remains of wood, but that look like they held wood. They had, they, there's the way that they're, um, like there was wood grain up against the inside of them. Um, I think that has to be material in cartoon because it's not true of the ones we have here. But. Yes. Um, the question about where is interesting. I mean, I don't think, you know, we don't know how many, how often they, you know, how extensively they were used. And metal takes quite some time before metal shows wear. Um, but the surfaces do look, looking at this, you know, 
rounded and handled. And then having been crushed, a lot of them with the, they, that was a form of wear that they were never designed for. Um, oh, here's a, here's, a, this is another interesting question. Have all the symbols on the cylinders been identified or could you tell us what they, and could you tell us what they represent? They have more or less been identified. Uh, some of them is not 100% certain, but the book that I mentioned by Emerilis Pompey, she goes into quite a lot of detail about the, the various elements of the decoration. And I mean, so for example, if you look at the, the um, cylinder that's in the image on the screen now, um, the rearing cobra head with sun disks on their head around the top are symbols of kingship and you know, royal protection. And then we have a row of ram heads with sun disks. And those are Ra, are Amun Ra, who's the primary god of Jebel Barakal, whose main temple was there. And then the papyruses are associated with rebirth um, because they you know, close up at night and open up in the morning. Uh, the goddesses, uh, we can't be certain that these things, a lot of the times we base these things on what the significance of them was to um, in e ancient Egypt because the ancient Egyptians left a lot more written records explaining what they um, meant there, but um, the meanings may have changed somewhat when they, they switched to Nubia. And, and Denise, the hieroglyphs were deciphered, right? Yes. The inscriptions, yes. 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 And, and the, these kings um, of Napata who were in control of Egypt seem to have devoted a great deal of time to studying um, Egyptian religion and ritual and you know even reviving things that had long you know thousands of years since gone out of use and uh, you know reclaiming you know libraries that were associated with temples and so there was they, they clearly were very thorough students of some very very old Egyptian ideas from centuries earlier We have a question, um, sorry, yeah. uh, we have a question saying that um, I like the theory of them being handles of something, including scepters. Would it be possible for the handlers to be handles that used to carry a, a royal body into the tomb? Um, or do they only come in pairs? Could they come in four as well? Or could they be temple rituals? And that's, um, I would say, I unless they were only going to be used once, I think they'd be very fragile to carry a royal body into a tomb. That said, they did make some jewelry just for ritual burial use. So um, if they were made just for the burial, then I think they could have been used in that way. Um, and they could also easily have been used in the temple situation. I think a lot of the objects that are found in royal tombs were also used in temples, but because the temples, I mean, the tombs were buried and left, and while they were usually robbed, in the case of temples, a lot of the precious materials, when the temple closed and went out of use, would have been recycled into something else. So, so the odds of finding something are much better in the tomb than in the temple. Yeah. We are, we are, there's so many more interesting ideas. We are coming close to the end. One person refers to um, the use of gold and silver as the skin and the bones of the gods. You know, there, there, there may be a relation to the gilded silver having um, a symbolic um, significance. Um, Tom Chase um, is telling us that mirrors were sacred in, in Japan and, you know, were mirrors sacred to the Egyptians. That's actually something I've never thought about, but... For the um, Egyptians, they were sacred. You often uh, see people on their funerary monuments holding up a mirror to their face, um, particularly women. Um, and we have um, painted coffins from the Middle Kingdom that have mirrors painted on the inside of them. So they definitely seem to have had um, a, you know, a significance for the afterlife of Egypt too. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Well, this is, um, dear audience, I don't know how old <laughs> is here, but these are really uh, a deeply, um, curious questions it's, uh, we could have an hour of discussion or more I'm wonderful thank you so much I think it is time for us to wrap up um, 
Denise, thank you so much. Oh. Um, what fun for those yes. who are, you know, within reach of the Getty Villa, please come and visit. Um, thank you again for watching and submitting your questions. Do please visit getty.edu for information on future programs. And then this um, lecture or this discussion will be available on YouTube um, in a few weeks if you want to, somebody re to refer it to it. And again, thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Yes, thank you.